So um, I have a very simple topic you can see today, right? The future of humanity, life and business. You know, it will take me two minutes and we'll, we'll have that solved. Um, I live in Switzerland right now and I'm originally from Germany. I, I spent 17 years in the US, uh, first as a music producer, musician, record producer, uh, a business that was very heavily impacted by, by digital, of course, right? Uh, and then uh, later on as an internet entrepreneur. So I have some first-hand experience to show to you. And it's kind of hard to describe what I do. Uh, there's a, somebody said the other day, I think it was a, uh, another futurist who said that if you have a job that cannot be described, then you're safe for the future. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? So if you think about that for a second. Um, we want to be safe for the future. Now, yesterday when I arrived, I was reminded of the battle between technology and humanity when I was at the airport uh, looking at the strike, you know, the taxi strike, right? This is really interesting to, uh, to see. I'm, a, I'm an Uber user in like 50 countries, okay? I know the founder of Uber from a long time ago, and I always have a split feeling about Uber. Right? So it's like a giant experiment. And you could say that when you work for Uber, you work for a database, right? You don't actually work for people. Right? Just, it's like your boss is in the cloud, right? It's a very strange thing. You know, it's like it takes some time to get used to. Yeah, it's a fantastic service. As a user, I love Uber. Right? Not just the price, but the experiment. But as a driver, you know, to think about there are so many issues. Will Uber succeed ultimately in constructing a business? Or is it just good and disrupting? And I would propose to you, as the future of Portugal is concerned, it's not enough to disrupt. Okay? To disrupt is a good thing to do, and it, it works for a while, right? but you also have to construct something new. And if you're in the digital economy, which we're going into at, high, at warp speed now, right? really fast speed, it's very important to find out what disruption is about but also to construct a new world out of the disruption. Right? And I think this is the challenge for Airbnb and Uber and companies like this. Right? So uh, briefly, this is really my job. Um, is it advancing? Yes, okay, good. So my job really is the uh, listening, right? Uh, I think this is also a way of getting yourself to be safe for the future. Uh, in China, they say, I know there's a big part about China later coming up, uh, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. It's really important to understand what is coming. If you have a good idea what is coming in five years, the chances are you can start thinking about shaping your future. You know, the future isn't fixed. We make the future. Right? We design the future. The future is not just waiting for us. Right? It's very important to realize, and, and the key trend of that, of course, is this change of technology as we're going from being human to being connected to technology all times. You know, when we use the mobile phone, when we use these devices, this is essentially our external brain, right? It's my second brain in here. My phone numbers, my banking, my music, my everything is in here, right? It's my second brain. Imagine if this brain becomes more powerful and is already very powerful, right? This brain is going to become a million times as powerful in the next five years. It's hard to imagine. Right? You will be able to talk without typing, just speak, right? That's already happening. Imagine what that will do for jobs, you know, for entertainment, for politics. Right? I mean, there isn't a single politician in the world left that is not connecting to the digital universe. Right? And sometimes people are saying, for example, what happened with the Brexit right, wouldn't have happened without technology because it was possible to shape opinion. Right? Technology is changing democracy. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Right? Don't think for a minute that technology is your savior. It is not. Technology is a tool. And it's a magical tool. Right? And because it's so magic, we sometimes think that the tool is the purpose, right? That the tool is not the purpose. The purpose is us, right? But we should not confuse those two things. When we talk about digital, we're not talking about us. Right? We are not digital. There is no future without, without technology. There's no doubt about that, right? Whether you're in marketing or advertising or whatever you're doing, technology is, is the tool that's everywhere. Right? But let's talk about this, what this really means and where, where this is going. And ultimately, 
This is the curve of the day, right? The exponential curve. And you know about Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, you know, those things are pretty old. Technology is doubling in power every 12, 18, 24 months. And now it's basically at that point to where we're no longer in the beginning of the curve, and we're actually at the pivot point, we're at the takeoff point, especially Portugal. I mean, you can see right now high, high connectivity, high use of devices, but some businesses are still not using the internet to, to, uh, to adapt to this, right? We're now at the point to where that will dramatically change. In five years, you will be 128. That's 30 times as far. If you're about my age and you have kids, chances are your grandkids will never know how to drive a car without a computer. They will never know how to drive a car themselves. They may not know what a CD looks like. They may not learn languages because they can use a machine that translates them. They may fall in love with a robot. No, just kidding. <laughs> they could do that now. But. So the exponential scale, this is really hard to understand. We're at the pivot point. Humanity will change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. Jobs, society, what we do, what we study. How can you go to university and study what you used to study 20 years ago and be ready for a future that's 500 times as different as today? That's a crazy idea. Right? We're going to need people that can make their own job. That is the number one criteria for your kids. Make your own job. Right? Entrepreneurship, understanding, new opportunities. Right? That's something that, you know, because I lived in America, everybody is a startup in America, right? Uh, when you go to a party in America, then people sit down and say, everybody wants to be the next eBay or Twitter, right? So it's if I go to a party in Switzerland, everybody is from a bank. Right? No, just kidding. Uh, that's not true. But you know, we're not so uh, we're not so interested in startups. But look at the numbers, right? Look at the numbers of the Internet of Things alone, right? The connected Internet of Things, right? This is cars, traffic lights, control systems, smart cities, smart farming. Uh, if you want to start a new business today, just take the old business and put smart in front of it, right? Smart cars, smart politics, that's impossible. Smart government, uh, smart shipping, smart containers, right? smart futurists. But look at this curve, right? W what kind of growth we're seeing there. This is a vast opportunity for, especially for countries like Portugal, you know, smaller countries that are ready to go international. But it's also a giant challenge, right? Imagine if everything is, I mean, that's already a lot now, right? If everything is connected, your suit, your clothes, right, your car, your doctor, it's very efficient. We can save, in some cases, 50, 60, 80 percent of costs. Right? But imagine what could happen if something goes wrong with all that information. Right? The responsibility. The responsibility of technology is as big as the, as the responsibility for nuclear power. Even bigger, because now we have artificial intelligence, your machines that can think which uh, allegedly, which I'll talk about. So now we're getting to a future to where artificial intelligence, you know, investing in machines that can come up with their own thinking is exploding. Um, it's also exploding, I think, here in Portugal. Right? Google has acquired like 27 companies that are in the deep learning, cognitive computing. Right? And this is IBM's motto, right? Welcome to the cognitive era. If you think about this for a second, what used to be cognitive? Right? Well, it's us, right? We, we, we were cognitive, allegedly. Right? Some people say the problem with thinking machines is not the machines, but that people don't think. Right? That could also be true. But think about machines that can do what we do, and this is an interesting angle, especially when you think about the future. Right? Everything is being connected. I live in Switzerland, so I use the cow. Right? The, the cows get connected in Switzerland now. Right? We want to know where they've gone, you know, how many times they've, they've complained, I, I suppose, but what they've eaten, you know, how good they are, and so on. But everything is getting connected. I mean, uh, I've come up in my new book, I've come up with this list of terms. Right? Uh, the, the terms are quite confusing, but here they are. <laughs> uh, there's so many of them. Right? Digitization, mobilization, personalization. 
Right? I'll give you just a, flip, a few. For example, datafication. Right? Everything that we used to do with people is becoming data. Remember, you used to go to the doctor, and the doctor would scribble down on a pad, and nobody could read it, and would pull it away, and then next time you come back, it takes out the pad. Right? That's over. Right? Now it's all your Fitbit and your diagnostic device and the cloud. Right? That, that has become datafied. All of a sudden, the doctor is in charge of your data and, and your insurance company. Right? Cognification, the getting used to things, automation, disintermediation. Uh, these are all trends that you can, you can read about. But basically, a good example of all of that stuff is the, the recent discussion about the blockchain. Right? You followed the blockchain, I'm sure. Which is a distributed network of handling data and information. That's a cryptocurrency, you know, encrypted, that we can trade without central supervision, allegedly. It's a great book by my friend Don Tapscott about how blockchain will change banking. But it's a much wider subject. But this wouldn't be possible without all, all of these trends. So if you want to be somewhat future-proof, you look at those 10 trends and figure out what they are, um, and you can read more with that stuff online. But it's kind of where things are going. And, I mean, the future right now is mind-boggling when you think about this. Right? We're entering the age of quantum computing. This machine is already quite powerful. Right? In five years, chances are this machine would probably not a million times as powerful, but a hundred thousand times as powerful. You know how many transactions we can process as a human? It's roughly 25, 30 quadrillion calculations per second. If I meet you outside in the hallway, and I can calculate in less than one second if you are a part of my tribe, my group, or not. You don't have to say anything. It takes one second for a human to identify another human in some sort of bizarre way that we don't know how that works. Right? So it's a lot of computations, but it's not just computations. Right? It's very hard to figure out. But machines will be able to do that. So these machines will be able to control the entire NATO air traffic uh, with one device that sits on the, on the laptop. They will be able to look at the entire social security system of Europe and run all the numbers and figure out who should get what and make suggestions. So that's really going to change our world in a very large way and of course also how we see the world will change right? dramatically. You know, if you're buying one of those things right now, a, a holographic headset or you know, virtual reality, uh, you, you are a geek or a tech guy right? or, you know, or a gamer. Right? But, you know, every policeman, every doctor, every lawyer will have those devices in the future because it turns you into a superhuman. I mean, imagine if you can wear this while you're operating, you can see all the information flowing. As soon as this works, it's roughly two, three, five years away, this becomes as normal as WhatsApp. Of course, then the, the backside, of course, is, is you would not want to live without it, right? Because somehow it's kind of an interesting angle. I, I think, socially speaking, of course, quite unacceptable, right? But, you know, this will dramatically change. And the other thing is, of course, the way that we control computers is just about to change. And that means no more typing, no more apps, no more web pages, right? We speak. Voice control is about two years away from mainstream control. Right now, you can already use really great stuff like dictating on the, on the iPhone works really nicely. It's two years away that you can uh, dictate in about 50 languages and also translate. So I was just listening to the speech of, of, of your president, right? and I, I got some of it. But the future is very close to where I can just get the app to listen to what he's saying and translate to me in real time. That's two years away. That already works, but it's not really perfect. So imagine what that means for older users. You know, if you have people around 70 or 80, and they want, they want to watch internet television, uh, that's kind of difficult today. You have to put in the cable and uh, subscribe. <laughs> in the future, you just sit down on your couch and say, play Columbo or play House of Cards, where he, where, where he kills this guy, right? And he just plays. That also means for shopping and e-commerce, right? keyword search. Nobody will know what keyword search is in five years. Right? There's no such thing. The machine knows who you are. It knows what 
a friend of yours, it has 25 million data points. You know, every single Google user, if you do stuff on Google, we have roughly 25 million data points on Google. And Facebook has many more. Can you imagine what kind of intelligence could be in that system? Uh, so get ready if you're in the advertising business, guys, get ready for that to be completely different in five years. That's a, a huge opportunity, but it also creates, of course, different challenges of things that we have to do. Here's a mock-up of such a scenario, right? Well, I asked something really complicated of my personal digital assistant, right? Now that kind of works, not, that would not be possible, right? <coughs> Very shortly, we're going to have complicated demands, right? Find a solution to unemployment in Portugal that covers people between 15 and 21. Off it goes, comes back with a suggestion, right, having read 100 trillion records. These things are just about the, around the corner and they're really going to change the way that we think of, of, of the world. So we're going from a world of web pages, which most of us know from the beginning. Right? And then we had apps, we download cool apps and we use those to navigate. Right? And now we're going to digital assistants, which I call the global brain. Right? It's essentially uh, my mobile phone in the cloud. And that can do all these things for me and create entirely new environments. Uh, William Gibson, a uh, science fiction writer, once said that technology is morally neutral until we apply it. Which means that if you're using this to create possibilities of e-commerce and data and voting and all these kind of things, that's great, but at the same time, of course, maybe you don't necessarily want to create the, the backside of it, right? You have to watch the unintended consequences. So, if we zoom forward in five years, we're going to live in a world that's completely digitized. There's no way back from this. Right? There's really no way, un unless you move to the mountains of Switzerland, even there would be difficult. <laughs> we cannot exist without technology. We can't compete without technology. And then we have to say, well, if we use all this technology and that's kind of magic, right? how do we prevent the abuse, you know, that the data mining? We don't want to live in a world where there's no secrets. Right? Secrets are a very human thing. So are mistakes, right? lies, right? kind of lies. Right? Mystery, discovery. We don't want to live in a world that takes all that away so that we can have better efficiency. Right? Americans may disagree. I think this is a really tough discussion, right? Because we, we want the benefit of technology, but we don't want all these side effects, right? It's like we want nuclear energy, maybe. We don't want to get killed in a crash. Right? This is an app, Amazon Echo. You may know Amazon Echo. Uh, four and a half million people have this in the US. Every single tech company is pushing these devices. It's like a mobile sitting on your, on your desktop, right? It's in the box and it listens to you the entire time. And so then you say, uh, Alexa, please turn off the light in the bedroom. Right? And she'll well, you have to connect it all, I suppose, but uh, it does all these things for you, right? And, and it picks your movies and it orders things from you. Right? And it's a, it's a really strange thing. So the question I have for you is, this, is it helpful? Is it lazy? Is it addictive? Kind of a strange thing, but that is the future that we're going towards, you know, the future that is going to have uh, machines as friends. You may remember the, uh, you know, there's the first robot called Pepper, right, that actually gets people to hug him. Right? There's the movie Her. Have you seen the movie Her? You have to see that movie that kind of shows how you fall in love with your computer. Not that that's anything new, really, but... And then we build relationships with screens, right? You know, kids actually, if you ask kids today, um, well, mostly American Anglo-American research on this saying that roughly 40% of kids, if you ask them who's your best friend, they say it's the mobile. Right? You think uh, that's kind of funny, but it's also kind of sad, right? It's like, yeah, well, it's a nice simulation, but it's probably not really a friend. So I would say as you're looking at technology, we should make sure that we use technology to, to get better, but as friends, you know, as, as partners. Well, if you're watching stuff on YouTube about these machines that offer digital advice, 
You know what the first headline is for all of those companies? The headline is, this is not a robot, it's a friend. Now, I think that's rather pathetic, right? Because it would be enough if it was a robot. If it worked well, then I'm happy, let it be a robot. It doesn't have to be a friend. It doesn't have to be something different. You've seen all these things on your mobiles, huh? That is the future of computing. We're not going to go to some stupid app and take a look at if uh, a tap is delayed again or if, uh, if TAM is still flying. Or on. We can just ask. System knows us. Seriously tempting, I think, for our future. Moving into a future that is what I call hell then. Huh? Hell and heaven. Right? Hell then is a, a scenario to where we have to say, well, if we want to use technology, we want it to be heaven for our customers as much as possible. And we have to find out what that is. Right? We don't want to make life hell for our customers just because technology makes it more efficient. We don't want to make it hell for our employees by firing all of them. Uh, if you're running a call center, chances are you can fire 95% of people in five years. Right? We're talking about 40 million people here working in call centers around the world. Not a big issue for Portugal, I don't think. But Brazil, yes. India, China. I mean, call centers are the most obvious thing, right? I mean, the calls, you want to change your flight ticket, the computer understands that sooner or later. And you can, natural language understanding for computers is, is here. Here's an example with Google's latest achievement. Uh, one of my clients is Google, but I still talk bad about it, but they're just kidding. I, I still critique them anyway, but uh, here's a great thing that they just launched called the Google Assistant. It's actually kind of funny uh, in a strange context, but I, let's play the video with the sound, please. Today, it seems like sometimes it's easy to feel like you need a little help with the stuff just in your own world. Your photos, phone, videos, calendars, messages, friends, trips, reservations, and so on and so on. Wouldn't it be nice if you had some help with all that? Wouldn't it be nice if you had a Google for your world? That's why we're building the Google Assistant. Hi, Amy. How can I help? You just ask it what you need. OK, Google, what do I have to do today? And your assistant understands and helps you out. You can even carry on a conversation with it. How long will it take to get to downtown Chicago from home? Here you go. What restaurants are there? Book a table at Cortino Restaurant. Sure. And the assistant is always there for you. So if you're on the road, you can ask it where to fill up. And if you're at home, you can ask it to play some music. Or if you're in a chat with a friend, it can show you what's playing tonight. It's like your own personal Google. Naturally. You get, you get the point, right? Uh, I like to say that uh, machines will do the living for us. This is completely convenient. I mean, it's, if this actually works, which I think it will, imagine why, why wouldn't we use that? Like Google Maps, I mean, who is not using Google Maps or Waze or, you know, to find their way in strange cities? You know, there's a thing called the glass cockpit syndrome, which is a, a thing for pilots, a, a huge issue. Because in the, in the airplanes, they change from using levers and routers and switches and dials, you know, to all screens, just all screens, right? just glass. And this has led to the fact, there's some recent research on this in the U.S., that the average pilot in the U.S. flies the plane three minutes per flight, right? and they forget how to fly, allegedly. I don't know if any pilots in the audience there would kill me for this, right? But imagine if we let everything be done by smart applications like that. Would we forget how to do anything ourselves? Like, like we would just talk to a machine and it would do it for us. You know, find me the right woman to date, or, or you know, look for a better job, or win the lottery for me, or something. Yeah. These kind of obvious things, I think ultimately that's, that's a destination that we have to think about. You know, this is a, a, a comic on the same, this part, this part is called Allo by Google, right? Because it's always listening. So in return for using these amazing things, the machine listens to everything that happens in your living room. Now let me ask you a question, would, would you agree to that? Would you agree to the machine listening to absolutely everything you're saying in order to give you chime in and give you a service. Right? Well, some people would say, well, who cares, right? Nothing to hide. Well, difficult question. Are we going to live in a world like this 
right? a world where essentially we allow those machines to go diving in our head. If you're in the advertising business, you love this idea. Right? I mean, the, the deeper you can go inside of people's heads, the more you can sell them. Right? That's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, advertising and marketing is based on this very idea that I know what you're thinking, right? But let's be sure about this. There is a limit to that, right? how much of that we can use. There's also a pro process of opt-in. Right? Advertising, I'm sure you're aware of this, ad advertising is a, a trillion dollar business, right? Advertising and marketing, as we know it, is ending because of this. There's a whole new way of doing it better with more responsibility that's just now being invented. A great opportunity, I think. So think of a world like this, right? Where our brains can go out and do all these things. I call this omnipresence, omnipotence, right? A world where we become as God. It's a great book if you're interested, you know, this God or not. This has it's a great book called Homo Deus you know, by a, a, a writer from, from uh, I think, Israel that you should read along with mine, of course. One eye here, one eye there. Um, where is this going? I think this is an interesting question to, to examine also because business forces us to, to get to that point. That, but here's the bottom line of this. When you think about technology and digitizing and transformation, right, technology is really not what we seek, but how we seek. Technology that's magic, that's great. Right? If technology is a little bit manic, People get obsessed, you know, that's kind of normal, like smoking or coffee or, you know, some mild addiction. Can be a problem, but most of the time, most of us have things that are a little bit addictive, right? But when technology gets toxic and it poisons us, that's a bad thing. So if you're in the advertising business, you want to be magic, you want to maybe a little bit of mania is all right, right? But you don't want to poison people's relationship by surveillance, right? By track, by constant tracking that turns them into an algorithm. You don't want to think of your customers as, as algorithms. They're not. You know how human decisions are being made? Huh? They're not based on data. This 98% of what we are is not, not based on obvious data, at least, right? So we have to keep that in mind when we think about how we digitize and how we transform digital. Right? Because the convergence of man and machine is not decades away, it's years away. You think this is bad news, it's not bad news. It could be bad news, but hopefully we'll be smart enough to deal with that. My kids will live in a world that will be so digital that we, we would think this is straight out of a Star Wars movie. Remember the scene in Minority Report where Tom Cruise goes inside the data, he pulls out the data and he, he takes and throws it over here and creates that? That's already reality, it's just very expensive. Right? But in a few years, we can do that. I'm talking to an airline now that is considering getting into the virtual transportation business. Would that be a business plan for TAP? I don't know. But virtual transportation does not mean transporting my body, but transporting myself in a HoloLens, you know, in, in a hologram. Right? So I travel to Singapore for a meeting, and I, but I go to the airport, and I actually go inside of the virtual plane. Right? This is all very close. So we have to think about what that means for, our, for business. And basically, the idea that technology cannot do something is going away. There are some tough cases like cancer, right? water, solar energy. But you know that everybody agrees, including the oil companies even, agree that in less than 20 years, solar energy will be at the point of getting enough electricity for all of our needs. Think about that for a second. That's, that means $35 trillion of lost assets, right? pipelines, oil platforms. If you're not ready for that change, you will definitely not be there to witness it. So it's very important to think about this is what's happening. It can be a little bit uh, challenging when you think about this. And really what we need to discuss is not just technology, because that is already happening. right? but the social contract. You know, my kids and their kids are going to live to be an average of 100 years old. Not because of genetic engineering, because of everything else. Right? All of us right now in this room already 
we're getting a present that's a, a third of the year, every year longer in lifespan. Okay. In, the, in the US, they say 70 is the new 50. And maybe in 10 years, 100 will be the new 60. Right? And then we go backwards, I, I don't know. But that will enable us, we have to think of a different social contract, different education, different retirement, different work. Right? I think Portugal is the perfect place for this. Because it's kind of a, a reset of economic revival that I can feel here happening. Right? If you compare, for example, to Germany, where we are not good at resetting, right? We're very good at production. We have a very hard time thinking of the, the future as such, because right? we're very much about today. So this is really a change that we have to embrace. And, and this is a future that is coming without a doubt that we will have machines that have a higher IQ than all of us in this room together. Hard to imagine, because machines are so utterly stupid still. I mean, a machine can play against the world champion in chess, and it can defeat the world champion in Go, but try to have a machine to talk to a two-year-old, right? It's not going to happen. In seven years, we have computers that have the capacity of our brain, and that problem will be solved. So then we can do things, you know, all these headlines you hear about every, every single day, thinking machines, cognitive computing. We're moving into a future where we're going from simple machines that can do tabulating, remember those days, to program computers, and now the future is to cognitive systems. Computers that can think. But when you use your Google map, right, if you're in the right country, it will already think for you, and it will say, you know what, I know you like sushi, so uh, here's a couple recommendations. It, it thinks for you, it actually anticipates you. This is a very big change. Now, when you think about computers that can think, forget about thinking like we do. Human thinking has not actually been fully explored how we think and how we do this. I mean, the part of emotional intelligence, for example, right? we don't really know how that works yet. So when you think about machines that can think, it's that machines don't think, right? they don't learn they don't understand like we do. It's very important to understand. Whatever smart technology we're going to use, whether it's cloud computing, whether it's robotics, whether it's artificial intelligence, they will be extremely useful to help us what we are best at, which is to do things that machines can't. Machines will get better, better, and better, and they will take jobs, yes. But that's the future we have to think about, understanding where we go with this in this world between algorithm, I call this on the left here, androidism, you know, the, the human thing. So. When you think about this for a second, you know, what do you value most in your life? Is it possession? Is it things that you've acquired? And now we, we can clearly see that, you know, we, all the research says there's one thing we value most, that's relationships and purpose and experiences. Experiences actually reshape the brain. Yeah, they actually make your brain different. And this is why advertising and marketing, for example, is such a crucial thing. When you create an experience around a product, you actually change its perception. So that's a world that we're moving into. And, and Daniel Kahneman, the world-famous psychologist, once said basically that we, uh, we think with the body, not the brain. Your customer isn't a brain. Your customer is a, a database. Your customer isn't an algorithm. Your customer isn't just a bunch of zeros and ones. We have to do better than that. Now, this is not to say you're going to ignore the zeros and ones because you can't. If you're not good at data mining, if you're not good at understanding technology, you will not survive this. There's no doubt about it. That's the flip side, right? It's we think with the body not the brain. So what I've observed in the past, you know, is that basically what has happened is that a lot of us are, if you've been in business for a while, we think of the past as a recipe for the future. Because we've been successful. It has worked. So in the car business, right, you can only take the car business as an example. There's a bunch of mantras in the car business, you know. Older people that have money buy nice cars, right? Is that true? Uh, it was true, no longer true, because kids are not getting driving licenses. 
If you're looking at the amount of, of sharing that goes on, car sharing, electric vehicles, public cars, uh, would have been unthinkable in terms of mindset, right? And yes, car sharing will not work somewhere in the north of Portugal where there's no city or no wireless network, <laughs> right? But so if you think about the future, the future is not an extension of the present. Right? You have to understand this is very important. If you're in the car business today, what is your number one objective? Self-driving, autonomous, electric, sharing, mobility. In fact, you talk to the CEOs of the car companies, they say they're no longer in the car business. They're in the mobility business. And this is what we have to understand about everything that we're doing as we transform. And we cannot just look to the past and then say well, it's going to be the same. There's a, a tsunami of transformation coming. And you know, this part of the business, I was involved in the music business, I was around in those days when Napster came on, remember Napster, right? Uh, that whole business model blew up. Well, today in the music business, if you buy a CD or a DVD and you give it to your kids for Christmas, they call a therapist, right? Think you've gone sick, right? That's stupid, right? I mean, Think of that, right? In 10 years, it's all in the cloud. And now you have the first bookshelf to project digital books, right? You pretend to have a library. I, I still have a real library. I love my library, but... And of course, you know, the other thing, of course, you notice with music, you have Spotify right, in, in Portugal, right? Or other services in the cloud. You know, you're paying 10 euros for Spotify. You know how many songs they have? 21 million songs. You know what the average value per song would be if you calculate, it would be a bunch of zeros. Right? And you paid 20 euros for a CD before. Right? Now think about the difference. <laughs> a tsunami of change that's coming to banking, to insurance, to, to government, right? to buying things, to e-commerce. Right? Here's a great slide from the uh, publishing business, newspaper business. So this is one of the most hardest, the hardest cases right? is journalism and press and media. Get a new business. Look at this model. Right? This is basically global advertising revenue and see how it basically drops dead around 2000 right? when mobile really came up. And you see who's getting all the new money? Not the publishers of the old, uh, it's, it, it's the new guys, right? Facebook. Facebook and Google make about 90% of most advertising revenues on the internet. And now Chinese companies are catching up to that. We don't really have numbers on that yet. But so really what's happening, I like to say, continuing to imagine our future in a linear way, like you know, one after the other, will lead to catastrophically flawed assumptions. If you think your future will continue like today, you're seriously mistaken. It's very highly unlikely, unless you make hot dogs or your gardener, even in that case. Right? It's, that is something we have to understand. It's something that we're going. We're heading into a perfect storm. And I think that's a positive thing, but look at the change, right? I would like you to take a look at your company, where you're, wherever you're working, and look at those four things. Right? This is the four areas of change, the four forces, right? The areas ripe for disruption. If you fit all four of those, you've, you've got to go home and start working on the business plan for the next five years. Right? Complex environments, banking, right? Regulation, government. Trust issues, also banking. Obsolete in the media areas, also banking. Right? Restricted access, also banking. Right? Energy, not quite as bad, yeah, but coming. Right? So that's the area ripe for disruption. And the taxi drivers are part of this scenario, by the way. That's why they're being disrupted. That doesn't mean they can be disrupted for free or without trading value. I call this the Tesla moment. Right? Now the Tesla moment is when you realize that the new guys who are doing things differently are not just utter idiots. Right? Like we did a seminar for the German car business six years ago with a bunch of CEOs. Six years ago, and we said, okay, self-driving cars, electric cars, battery-driven cars, car sharing, right? In a room like this, we, had, we got laughter. Right? Laughter. And now they're saying, oh, now we have to spend three and a half billion euros to catch up with Google. That, that's painful. Some companies will not survive. You don't want to be in a place where you realize that your Tesla moment is behind you. 
where these guys weren't idiots, they were actually doing something real. And it's very important to think about digital native business models. So here's one of those. Uh, the future really is about providing experiences. Because now everything is becoming digital. Very soon we can print the most standard products like shoes and iPhone cases and what have you, even bags we can print on demand. That has been long promised, but finally happening. Right? FedEx and UPS are already looking at the possibility of instead of shipping, they have a giant printing truck that costs like 3 million euros. And that truck is driving around town printing things on demand right? with a license from whoever prints them. Airplane parts, car parts. Sounds like science fiction and not far away. The future is providing experiences. Right? If you can think of a business model that provides an experience, you can think of something that stages something and becomes a different thing, I think that would be good. Here's an example, Mercedes-Benz. I, I spoke at their event recently. This is a new van called Advance. And this van was a little bit stretched for some reason. <laughs> it looks giant, but it's not that big, actually. This van has two drones on top and a robot in the back. And instead of the driver going out and delivering to each person, he gets out at one person that he has to talk to while the drone delivers the others, the small one. And inside the van, the, the driver doesn't actually look for, pa for packages. It comes to him automatically based on the order of the trip. Right? Creating an experience. Here's the a short scene from their drone delivery. Okay. You know what their, the headline on this is? Mercedes-Benz vans will not sell cars, it will sell outcome. Right? It will sell the result of the success of the business. Now that's a risky business model, obviously, compared to selling you know, 390,000 vans or so a year, just selling the vans, right? But this is something where we're going, and you know, this is basically what's happening. And so in this context, we have to understand that data is actually the new oil. Right? This was already said 15 years ago. Reality is that our world is run by the most powerful companies, most of them US and some Chinese now, that are based on data. And here's an interesting chart. On the left, you can see the most powerful companies, including some Portuguese companies in the old days, were all companies and banks. 2006. On the right, you see who's there in 2016, just 10 years later, is the data companies, right? technology companies. The most powerful currency of the world is data, and the most valuable brands are those that deal with data, with a few consumer goods in here as well. That, that we have to understand. The intelligence is the new gas, a new petrol. Right? And so, What's going to happen, I think this is going to be a, a primary discussion in Europe. If data is the new oil, we must regulate it. Imagine for a second if we hadn't regulated oil. I mean, it was bad enough with the bad regulation that we had, right? But if we hadn't regulated oil and gas and nuclear, God, you know, probably wouldn't be sitting here now. We'd be mopping up oil somewhere. So in the future, we're going to have to think about how does it actually work, right? When companies are using data, how do they respect that we're human, that we have secrets, right? that we don't want to be naked all the time, that we have rights? If you can find that balance, you find the future. I would encourage you not to copy the Silicon Valley model of disruption. That's over. It's the, the disrupted model is being disrupted. It's now a model of creating new values that fit us. So I think that's something we're going to see around the world. You know, I call this dataism. Right? It's worshiping data. It's a new religion. Yeah, you know, uh, the mobile phones are like uh, the new cigarettes, and the internet is a new religion. And so this is dataism as a form of belief that data is always true. But you know the simple saying: garbage in, garbage out. Right? You give a certain kind of data, you get other data back, and you can improve that. But the bottom line, the data is not all there is to reality. If you use TripAdvisor, anybody use TripAdvisor here? Right? I pity you, but I, I sometimes use it. If you only, especially in Portugal, that's especially true in Portugal for some reason. If you eat only where TripAdvisor tells you, you are in deep trouble. Right? 
Does it mean it's useless? No, it doesn't mean it's, it, it, it's interesting, right? but it's not real. That's like saying the robot is my wife. It's not true. It's not the same. Right? And it will never be the same, even if it gets better. Right? This is a different kind of worldview that I think we have to maintain. Right? Your customer just isn't a guy that you crank the lever and out comes the money. Right? That would be a bad approach to a future. I think that's something we have to think about. Right? So uh, I'll, I'll wrap up so we can have some questions. Um, the CEO of Google said something very interesting the other day. He said basically that Google is going from mobile first to artificial intelligence first. This is a big concession for a company that makes two and a half billion dollars a month with advertising based on keywords. So anything you do in the, in the era of e-commerce, you can safely say it's going to be impacted by this whole scenario. We must start asking more questions about why. When you think about transformation, the first question you, can, you may want to ask, how do I do this? Or does it work? Right? The second question should be, why? why? Why is it good? Why is it a good thing to do that? Where is it going? That's, I think uh, the future that we're heading into in a world that's based on the Internet of Things and all the connectivity and all the things that we have around us. Right? So I'm going to come to the end. i uh, just give you a couple of headlines. Right? First, don't use your amazing technologies to cheat the world. You know the saying about software eating the world? Well, you don't want software to cheat the world, right? We're just to present something that isn't really correct. Right? This is a great gift showing you what happens when you think of the world as a giant software engine. Um, to be careful to put humanity in the center, it was just an announcement by the big technology companies a few days ago on this partnership on artificial intelligence. You know what the headline is? It's a partnership for artificial intelligence to benefit people and society. That's pretty ambitious. I think that is the right direction. I think it would also be a great opportunity to put human flourishing in the middle, to think about ways of doing this. I'm going to have to jump ahead a little bit here because we do want to get to some questions. While I'm fiddling with this, you can uh, you know, feel free to come up with a couple of questions. So. Important, I think, for us in the future is if you want to have a job in the future, you want to be meaningful, you should see if you can become extraordinary, extraordinary human, right? whether you can become non-routine. Now, the word routine is a bad word here. Right? If you have a job with routine, as I was saying earlier, if you can describe it, it will be automated. Right? Very important to keep this in mind. And I sometimes use the, the image here of the driver, the self-driver. Right? It's like what will happen, in, and I think the most important thing we can remember from this is that we have to put the human inside. Right? Right? Keep the human in the loop. That's where the value is being generated. It's very important when we think about the digital futures. So combining what I call the algorithm, the machine intelligence, and the algorithm, I think that is the, the power of human purpose, right? the power of the context, where we're going in a world that's going to be those three streams, technology, data, humanity. Um, the important thing I think here in the end is what Alvin Toffler once said, famous uh, science fiction author and futurist, says the future belongs to those who can unlearn and relearn. Right? I think that's what we're doing here, so I'm very happy you're here and you listen to my talk. Now we're going to take some questions. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Gert. We're running uh, against time, uh, so I think we'll have, uh, I don't know if there's someone that wants to make one question. Uh, Common, I a, Common is fine as well. <laughs> I had a feeling uh, during uh, your speech that was in the trailer of a movie about uh, artificial intelligence, I was just waiting for Schwarzenegger to come in with all the robots. Is there hope for us? No, no, just kidding. Um, I think when you think about artificial intelligence and what computers can do, you have to forget all the stuff you see on television and in the movies, right? This is entertainment based on fear. Americans are very good at this. You know, I lived there for a while. I know they're creating movies that make you worried about being killed by robots. The reality is we're far away from robots having any such power. The, the potential that's much bigger is that we start acting like robots. Right? We start acting like machines because they're so much like us, right? 
So for example, when you, when you go to a restaurant and you see a family sitting there, everybody's going like this and, and talking to somebody, somebody in Kazakhstan about their meal or something, they're actually communicating with others rather than with the people that are there. I think this is the major issue for us is that we're going to start use technology to dehumanize. So don't worry about that part of it. I think we, we have to worry about how we can become more human so we can create more sense and more purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, just to reiterate this point, right? Because we're talking about digital transformation today. If you do not transform digitally and you do not adopt the technology, you will be utterly useless. Right? Uh, and that is what I call digital Darwinism. Right? However, the goal is to go beyond that transformation of technology and transform us, right? Tr transform how we look at the world and how we generate value. And that doesn't mean we're going to become technology. Right? In my book, I use a, a key word that says we embrace technology, but we don't want to become it. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that's a crucial difference. There was a question here. <clears throat> how do you define human <laughs> consciousness? Um, there are some um, uh, investigations, some uh, scientists telling that we are living in a simulation. <laughs> yes, well, it's a nice one though, fear. Yeah. Well, the way I defi define human is, this is a difficult question, it's just like a question of happiness and ethics, right? Uh, many things that we are are not clear to anyone really. There's many things that happen between humans that we have no idea how that happens. Right? Uh, there are many things that are scientific to a level that we still don't understand at all. And other things like, you know, call them spiritual beliefs, understanding, love, emotions, that, that we don't understand. No, no computer will ever understand. So the best thing we can do is let the computers do all the stupid work, right? All the routine work, all the number crunching, all the delivery of garbage. Fine with me. No right? falling in love. Right? And then they'll pay for us to live better. Right? But we should not confuse those machines with us. Right? Just like we should not confuse the mobile with, with my brain. Right? This, is a, this is a subsection of our reality. So I think that humans are far, far superior to anything that we have invented for quite some time. That may change in 100 years, and then we may, we may have a problem, right? But uh, for the time being, it's good for us to really understand technology and to use it, but to transcend it, right? to create human value. I mean, in business, the value that you're offering is not great technology. I mean, that would be stupid. Anybody can buy technology. Right? Anybody can get SAP HANA or, or Salesforce or whatever. Right? What we supply in business is trust and relationships. Yeah? That's how business works. And we use technology to amplify that. That is really the, the meaning of transformation. Mm -hmm. We don't have more time for more questions. Uh, thank you, Gert, for being with us. And uh, thank you, everyone. We're going to make uh, uh, a coffee break now. Okay. And uh, we'll return. Thank you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>